Hello, <clears throat> hello everyone. Um, welcome. There are still people arriving. That's why we waited for a few minutes. Um, so, um, but uh, let's let's start with introductions. My name is Denise Göktürk. Um, I'm a professor in the Department of German at UC Berkeley, um, and I would like to welcome you all very warmly. Uh, to another exciting installment of our series, Archives of Migration, the power of fiction in times of fake news. The idea for this series of Zoom conversations was launched uh, under the pandemic lockdown by my colleague Elisabeth Krimmer at UC Davis and me. Um, and today's event will be the eighth installment. Um, initially, supported by the German consulate in San Francisco. The series is currently enabled by our respective departments, as well as our cooperation partners, uh, the Goethe Institute San Francisco, uh, the German Historical Institute and the Institute for European Studies at UC Berkeley. Uh, so many thanks to all our enablers at these institutions for, for their continued support uh, and also to, especially to Ray Savard, who is doing uh, behind the screens hosting for these events. He has been a great help. Uh, for, uh, so I'm, I'm just going to say a few words of introduction um, and explain how this panel came about uh, before I hand over to my colleague, Lila Balint, um, who will be moderating today's conversation with Kurt Beals and Jenny Erpenbeck. Um, it's my tremendous pleasure to, today to welcome uh, our illustrious guest, Jenny Erpenbeck, who is currently on the East Coast teaching a grad seminar, uh, graduate seminar at NYU. And we are delighted that you were able to make time and join us today. Uh, Jenny has, uh, yes, <laughs> has, uh, she has grown to be one of the most well-known contemporary German writers on an international scale over the past 20 years. Um, and she's been enormously productive. It's really hard to keep up with her publications. Um, her latest novel, Kairos, uh, was just published last year, 2021, and you can uh, listen to it uh, as an audio book read by the author herself. Um, uh, I've grown quite addicted to her voice. <laughs> her um, novels and novellas feature many different stories of migration and transformation, 
Uh, starting with, uh, you know, Geschichte vom alten Kind and the novella Sibirien, for which she won the Ingeborg Bachmann Prize back in 2001. Um, also, uh, then on to Heimsuchung, um, the, relating the, the changing fate of a house from the persecution of Jews during the Third Reich to post-war Germany. Alla Tage Abend, uh, again, a, a journey from the Städtel to uh, socialist East Berlin, and then Gehen being begangen, um, which revolves around the plight of African refugees in Berlin, um, uh, tackling um, Europe's failed policies regarding migration and asylum. So all of these books are available in beautiful English translations by Susan Bernofsky, uh, also translated into many other languages. Um, and uh, Jenny has won many prizes, including the Thomas Mann Prize in 2016, and her name has been flagged as a potential candidate for the Nobel Prize for Literature. We'll see. <laughs> we hope. <laughs> she has also <laughs> written stage plays and directed multiple opera productions. Um, uh, so a favorite of mine is her little book, Dinge, die verschwinden, um, uh, published in 2009. And Kurt Beals translated excerpts from this uh, book for an exhibition on city, space, and architecture uh, at Haus der Kulturen der Welt in Berlin. Uh, the book begins with a wonderful uh, little vignette remembering the Der Palast der Republik, taking us right back to a Berlin um, which no longer exists, to those days of living by the wall, and uh, which we both experienced actually from different vantage points. Jenny as a student in East Berlin and I was a student in West Berlin in those <laughs> days. <laughs> so uh, the title of today's event, Blind Spots in Shared Memory, is adapted from uh, Jenny's 2018 uh, Pewterball, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Pewterball lec uh, lecture, uh, and it's included in her collection of essays, speeches, and reflections, Kein Roman, um, beautifully translated by uh, Kurt Beals as not a novel. Um, yes, uh, and uh, the book has been included in World Literature Today's 75 Notable Translations of 2020. And this book will actually be the focus of today's conversation. Um, and also we will be reading, he hearing passages from it. Uh, Kurt holds a PhD from the Department of German at UC Berkeley. Uh, welcome back, Kurt. <laughs> Uh, he is an associate professor of German and comparative literature at Washington University in St. Louis um, and author of the book Wireless Dada, um, Telegraphic Poetics in the Avant-Garde, um, which was published 2019 by Northwestern University Press, um, and as well as numerous articles, which I'm not going to um, uh, <laughs> list here now. Um, Today's gathering would not have happened without Kurt. Uh, it was him who made contact with Jenny and facilitated scheduling at a point when I was ready to give up uh, since I was not getting anywhere with uh, her agent. <laughs> um, and we are honored uh, to host um, Kurt's and Jenny's first joint public appearance in our series today. <laughs> um, so my dear colleague, uh, Lila Balint, um, assistant professor in the Department of German at the University of California, Berkeley, um, is the perfect moderator for, for this conversation. She holds um, a PhD from Stanford in her dissertation, Ruins of Utopia, she traced the afterlife of socialism in the contemporary novel. She is um, currently at work on a monograph tentatively entitled After 1989 um, that examines the aesthetics and modalities of historical representation after the fall of the Berlin Wall. 
Uh, she has lived in Budapest, Leipzig, Munich, and Berlin, and she has published work on 20th and 20th century and contemporary German literature, culture, intellectual history uh, in its transnational European context in various journals such as Gegenwartsliteratur, the German Quarterly, and Die Wiederholung. Um, before I hand over to Lila, let me just say, um, in these days, as a brutal war is raging in the Ukraine, affecting all of Central Europe, displacing millions of refugees once again, um, as the old Cold War fronts are resurrected ever more forcefully, this conversation seems especially timely. We need the, pres we need the precision of language that Jenny Elpenbeck brings to the table in her stories to unpack how divisions operate on micro levels of every, in everyday life and trace how blind spots in memory occlude a much needed sense of shared humanity. So um, welcome again. And without further ado, um, over to Lila. I think the conversation will, will evolve in English and German, both languages are allowed, uh, and the audience also is allowed to participate via the chat and raise questions. So, uh, Lila, the screen is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Denise, for this warm introduction. And it's such a pleasure and honor to have you both here. And this is your first appearance. Denise is saying this is the first appearance of the two of you together. So we are even more thrilled uh, about that. Um, just uh, so we all have about an hour long conversation. And um, if you um, have questions uh, that emerge during this conversation, please feel free to, um, to type them into the chat and then we'll open up the discussion to our audience um, around uh, 15 minutes before, before the event actually ends. Um, so the 12, uh, it's 1.15 West Coast time. Um, so um, I will uh, go back. I'll start with, uh, with the book that Denise just mentioned, uh, her favorite, namely Dinge, die verschwinden. I'm gonna hold it here into the camera. And because it is one of the few books that actually has not been translated into English. And it is quite a marvelous collection of short prose pieces um, um, entitled Dinge, die verschwinden. And it came out with, um, in 2009 as, um, in, um, um, and then it came also out in, as a paperback and hopefully it will be published in English. Um, and I say hopefully because the collection as a collection, I think, records, reflects, meditates on the different scales and manifestations of change with incredible precision and through the power of details. And so I'm just gonna name a few things here to illuminate to the audience who may not be familiar with it, decaying buildings, um, but also their deliberate destruction brought about by political decisions that declare them defunct the sudden end to human life and sometimes it's slow passing or when the end doesn't come suddenly but drags on and how objects, for instance, a bicycle stops being a bicycle and is regarded simply metal as it is made to transform back into what in German we would say Wertstoff, to name only a few examples of the different scales of, and manifestations of change. And Yanni, I wonder when I look at these pieces, but also your oeuvre as a whole, I wonder what has made you such an astute observer and chronicler of change. What do you think sort of um, prompted you to look so uh, closely at these phenomena that may not be available to people who just pass by these sites? Uh, I think uh, it was the um, the moment when the wall fell um, was uh, more or less exactly the moment when I started my my life as a uh, like so to say grown up person, and I think it um, uh, also before I I like to write, but in a way uh, the 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 main subject of my writing. Uh, came to me with this fall of the wall and with all the changes that followed. So um, 
as an East German, every East German, I think has has many many experiences with uh, things that disappear, that that change, that were replaced by something else, um, and it's uh, in a way it puts the the question um, what identity means, what what stays with you, even if all the circumstances around are changing, uh, who who is you, who is who is the one who's who is staying. Um, yeah, I think this was the, the starting point for my writing. Yeah. Do you see generational differences when you say for every East German, do you see generational differences, uh, what it may mean for your generation or for your generation of your parents, for instance, uh, who are also, I, I believe your father is also a writer, right? Yeah. Um, there, there, there are differences, of course. Um, for people who, uh, who were writers a long time before all that happened, they, they just had something else in the middle of their writing, like thinking about the, this kind of society, how it could work and how it doesn't work for, and, uh, and, and uh, so they would deal with this kind of society while I was like dealing with a crash of the society and with all that, what, what came afterwards. And, and also the, the, the conscience of, the fragility and of transition was in the center of my mind while for my father it was rather losing his his subject it was like losing the society that interested him as as an uh, like um yeah as it was said late as it was called later an experiment that mm. might lead to some better way of of life uh perhaps not in uh, as far as uh, finances and consume is concerned, but in, uh, as far as, as ideas and utopia is concerned, as a, as a, yeah, it was supposed to be a more human and, and more a society that was based on solidarity. And the, uh, so for him, it was like ending something mainly. And so he, he would stop writing. He only published one book after the war was gone. And then um, he said, uh, the new society now that uh, it doesn't interest him in anymore and he doesn't feel the, the urge to write anymore. And, and also with a generation of writers like, like Ingo Schulz, who are a bit mm -hmm. older than me, it, it was different because they already had started to, um, like to actively uh, take the, take actions to or to think about uh, how to how to change the society themselves. So I was a bit too young for this, and 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 of course much younger than the the, the generation of my father. Yeah. Um, so in Dinge, die verschwinden, the few people know that this was actually uh, published in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Sonntagszeitung as a column. This is how they came about. Is that correct? Yeah, the, this was as it started. And then for the book, I wrote another three pieces to, to make the book complete. I see. So I always, so I, when I think about the media environment of these pieces, the way they came about, I find it kind of astounding because it's not that the Frankfurter Allgemeine Sonntagszeitung in general had such a had such a um, interest in, in, in themes related to the GDR or any, anything else than, than the usual narratives that, we, that, that are available. And so I, I, I was thinking in, um, um, of these pieces and somehow in, in, in tension to their environment in, they f in which they first evolved. Naya, the good thing was that I was free to choose my, uh, my subject and I invented the, the things that disappear. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't invent them, but I invented the, the kind of, of row of, of pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, they, they used to have uh, this kind of column every year. They, they would invite a writer and I, I took over from Nicole Kraus, uh, who I also became friends with in the course of, mm -hmm. of, of like taking over and getting interested in each other each other's writing. And so so everyone, 
was allowed to choose whatever he or she wanted to choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and the volume ends um, with you playfully invoking the disappearance of the author. Um, and I quote from here, Bestimmt haben Sie schon mal von der Theorie gehört, dass der Autor verschw... And then the word itself also disappears. And um, so you cut the word verschwindet, essentially. And that's how it ends. Um, but in the pieces, and here we, I want to transition to sort of like um, um, not a novel, um, you pick up something that is related or actually very similar because sort of what I would call the radical instability um, in the construction of the author or maybe put differently, a constant hide and seek between covering, uncovering and discovering of uh, sort of uh, in the process of writing um, um, yourself as a, as a, or constructing yourself as an author figure. Um, can you say more about that? Like why that is sort of a, such a centerpiece of, 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 of your, of your, of these, at least these pieces here. Uh, Naya, it's uh, strange to to make such a collection uh, because it's for me it was the first time to to look back to what I uh, wrote uh, like in the, the, during the, the my whole life so to say my writing life um, and yeah it. It's strange because I, I write about this in the in the uh, forward in the pre preface or what mm -hmm. is it forward preface yeah. uh, so, so uh, that um, some of the texts I I was invited to write and uh, to to uh, at this or uh, that occasion and um, in some. Of these uh, cases, I would say yes because I know knew that there is something waiting for, uh, like being written, mm. and I I could say I, I could accept this invitation because there is something uh, which will be brought uh, or will be like appear in the moment of of starting uh, to to write about this or that and and so in a way uh, it was also that. Uh, sometimes other people um, like made me look about myself which was strange so 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 it was also the connection to the interests of others or also the, the you know you some of the texts are connected to other authors and you would think about the connection what kind of connection is there and and what is you and what is the other one who's writing and and what subjects are we sharing perhaps or or what is the difference mm. yeah. um perhaps this would be a really good moment for us to actually get a glimpse of the text and uh we have made the quite um unusual decision that uh that the trans we will hear the translator Kurt deals first, uh, and then we'll we'll go over uh, to a passage uh, uh, in German read by Yeni. Um, yeah, Kurt. Great, thank you. And I think this actually connects very nicely to the discussion of Dinge uh, die verschwinden because this actually begins with disappearance as well. So you'll see how that theme crosses over from the earlier book um, into this as well. So this is an excerpt from. Uh, a piece called Homesick for Sadness that's in um, not a novel. Places always disappear in two stages. This becomes clear to me for the first time when I notice something beside the large rubble heap, a droopy mat of red, sorry, a droopy mountain of red rubber mats that used to cover the athletic field. The first stage, the place is emptied out, grown over. It collapses, but it's still there. And then the second, the place is wiped away and something else moves in. Only after it has been wiped away, cleared off, disposed of, can the place that was once there give way to something else. That derelict fermata in the midst of Berlin Mitte had at least been a sort of placeholder all that time for my memories of the school, although certainly it wasn't always a happy place. Schools seldom are. A wilderness right in the center of the up and coming neighborhood of Mitte this single square kilometer was also something like a bygone era that sticks in the throat of the new one until it can finally be spit out. Only when the surface has been smoothed out, when all visible traces have been removed, 
to this forgotten place and the forgotten time contained within it proceed down their final path, becoming a purely mental state, if you will. From then on, they will no longer exist anywhere except in the convolutions of my brain and the convolutions of certain other brains. Each will find its final refuge in one memory or another. Outside the school's main entrance, there was a plaza big enough for all of the students to assemble in a square formation for the flag ceremony. We also gathered there when the administration held a fire drill. And from April or May on, we would play a game there according to our own strict rules, jumping over elastic bands that were tied together and stretched between two girls' legs. We used waistband elastic, and back then we called the game gummy hopsa. Today, most Germans would probably say gummy twist. In America, they call it Chinese jump rope. For the first round, the bands would be at ankle height. For the second round, at the knees. For the third round, at the hips. The jumps that allowed you to move your two feet separately were always easier than those that required you to hop over one of the bands with both feet together. The school's front steps, which led from this plaza of games, flag raisings, and fire drills to the main entrance, also served as the backdrop for our annual class photos, with the taller students arrayed on the steps behind the shorter ones as in a choir. A plaza that's just the right size for all of the students to assemble in a square formation for the flag ceremony. Where's my blue pleated skirt? Where's my cap? Why isn't it staying on? Come here, I'll fasten it with a bobby pin. No, that hurts. A plaza like that is covered in slabs of cement. And when a plaza like that is covered in slabs of cement, then it's a good place for jumping over an elastic band stretched between two girls' legs. A flag racing can be a routine, and so can a game that girls play when the weather is finally warm enough to wear knee socks. There on the spot where that plaza used to be, the students are all gone now, and the word flag raising is a term that has served its purpose, a rubble word. There on that spot that was left empty to make room for the students' orderly assemblies, pieces of concrete from the demolished building have now piled up, one on top of the other. This mountain of concrete has a special significance to me, because on one of those pieces, I can see the small blue tiles that covered the girls' bathroom. Did I like that bathroom? Is it even possible to like a school bathroom? Don't I look forward to the future, to the apartments or offices with great natural light that will soon take the place of this former socialist school bathroom, to granite, stainless steel, oak, and the place of classroom bulletin boards bearing slogans like, the fire started with a spark, to elevators with doors that softly close, in place of the open air where students responded to the command for peace and socialism, be prepared with a snappy or weary, always prepared. No, strangely enough, it has nothing to do with the question of whether the past that is now being replaced was pleasant or unpleasant, good or evil, honest or dishonest. It was simply time, time that really did pass in this way that I knew and that was preserved in those rooms. Time that was once the present, a shared present that included my own personal present. Time that entailed a particular concept of the future, which I knew well, even if that future itself remained a very distant one. The future isn't what it used to be, Carl Valentin said it well. By now, I know what became of the bright future that our school was preparing us for. The hard slog, what Brecht called the struggles of the plain, in contrast to the struggles of the mountain. That plane proved to be too wide, but what now? Now there's another future. Or do the present and the future now merge together forever? And when these ruins are cleared away once and for all, will the past be written off once and for all too? Are we arriving now and forever in an era that claims validity for all time? Now that the school basement, which was sometimes used as a vaccination clinic, and the cafeteria, which still served dishes like blood sausage with sauerkraut, and the auditorium where our pictures from art class hung have been reduced to rubble, I see that the two stages of disappearance mentioned above correspond to two stages of grief for me. As the building slowly decayed, I initially grieved for those specific, those specific places, the vaccination clinic, the cafeteria, the auditorium, not for the rooms themselves, of course, but for those rooms as the setting for my everyday childhood experiences, a setting that was slowly rotting away, as if that everyday life so far in the past could also grow old and weak in retrospect. But as this rubble is wiped away, I begin to experience a more fundamental sort of grief that transcends my own biography. Grief for the disappearance of a place that was such a visible injury, for the disappearance of sick or disturbed things or spaces, which offer proof that the present can't make its peace with everything, an apt expression. 
In the second stage, the cleansing stage, I grieve for the disappearance of unfinished or broken things as such, of those things that had visibly refused until now to be incorporated into the whole, the disappearance of the dirt, if you will. In places where grass just grows, where trash piles up, human order is put into perspective. And considering that every one of us is mortal, it's never a bad thing to bear that perspective in mind. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kurt. Um, Yanni, would you, would you read the, 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 the passage that follows? <clears throat> yeah, wait. I have it in my computer. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. <clears throat> Als Kind habe ich die Ruinen geliebt. Es waren heimliche Orte, unbesetzte Orte, wo das Unkraut kniehoch wuchs und zu denen uns kein Erwachsener folgte. Es waren manchmal auch gefährliche Orte, Orte mit schönem Ausblick, Orte, an denen wir Entdeckungen machen konnten, die nur uns allein gehörten. Ruhige Orte, an denen nichts passierte, als dass die Wolken darüber hinwegzogen. Orte, an denen man durch mehrere Stockwerke und leergebrannte Fenster hindurch den Himmel sehen konnte. Orte, an denen Hirtentäsche wuchs und die Herzen davon konnte man essen. Es waren Orte, die Landschaft waren, mitten in der Stadt. Spät erst habe ich verstanden, dass auch das, was meinem kindlichen Blick vertraut war, in Wahrheit eine zerstörte andere Zeit war, die der Neuen im Hals steckt, bevor sie endlich ausgespuckt werden kann. Einen Unterschied allerdings gab es. Dass die Ruinen dastanden, kostete damals nichts. Die Zeit lief nicht, die Zeit stand. Kein Mensch redete über Geld. Das Privateigentum an Grund und Boden war abgeschafft. Die Immobilien machten ihrem Namen alle Ehre. Sie waren da und bewegten sich einfach nicht. Thank you both. Uh, and uh, I'm so happy that we can have this conversation about the translation. And I know that you've had a long back and forth about the translation. And what were sort of the, the salient issues that came up uh, when Kurt, you wanted to translate uh, Yeni's German into English. I mean, I think with, all, with each text, there are different kind of obstacles and challenges. So what, yeah. Yeah, um, one thing, well, I think a lot of the, the queries that I initially sent to Jenny were very sort of factual information oriented queries that related to the specifics of terms that just are not part of my experience, terms that were GDR terms that maybe even people in the West would not have been familiar with. Um, and in some cases, she's writing about specific words that have this relationship to the GDR context. And there's a real challenge there because English does not have an equivalent um, to a term that was GDR specific. So, um, so part of it was just figuring out how to um, how to find some sort of substitute for the terminology. Um, but I think a lot of it also ended up being a conversation about, um, about style, actually, and about the precision, Denise mentioned this earlier, um, the precision of the way that Jenny uses language. Um, here in this passage, we have, of course, literal concrete, um, but I think there's a concreteness also to the language that, um, or that the, 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 the particular words and their particular arrangement sometimes seem almost transparent. There are passages in Jenny's writing that I think you can read without stumbling over anything and you might sort of forget the level of, um, the level of craft that goes into creating those sentences because they don't necessarily show it off. I mean, there are some writers who I think really like to do the, the big flourish and remind you that they're doing something elaborate. And often in Jenny's writing, I think the level, the craft is much more, um, much more subtle, much easier to sort of read past. But then when you stop and read it again, you notice how finely constructed everything is and how finely tuned the mechanism is. And so there's a passage, for instance, here um, about the, the surface being smoothed out. Mm -hmm. And I had initially, translated that in a way that it was something like, 
when the visible traces have been smoothed out and scrubbed clean. And Jenny's comment was that the surface needs to be there because the surface is very important, but also the traces may be scrubbed away, but they're not being scrubbed clean. And so it needs to be the surface that is being scrubbed clean, cleaned of traces. And I think there were a number of other passages. Um, there's one I remember that um, described the sound of a door closing. And I wrote something like, um, the, hear the sound, hear the way that the door closes. And Jenny's response was something along the lines of, you don't hear the way, you hear the door. And so there were aspects of the way that Jenny uses language and the, the precision, I think, of her word choice and arrangement that became clearer to me over the course of, the, um, over the course of our collaboration on revising the translation, where I really gained a clearer sense of what the intention is behind a lot of the choices that she's making linguistically. Yeah. Jenny, how is it? Yeah, sorry. And no, it was an interesting experience also for, for me. Uh, and, and I think um, code really uh, like slipped into my mind, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so he came, he came very close and, and it, it was fun discussing all this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I did feel like there was a kind of co-authorship mm -hmm. going on in parts of it. I mean, translation is always a kind of co-authorship, but sometimes you don't have the author there to, to provide input. And I felt that through your, in, through your commentaries and your feedback, I, I gained a better sense of the question that a translator always asks themselves, what would the author do if they were writing this in English? And I felt that over time, um, after working with you and going back and forth, um, I felt that I could make that decision with a more informed perspective. It was less speculative. And because I had, because I had access to, to you and because you could explain why you did what you did, where you did it, um, I could actually say, okay, this is the reasoning process. This is how she works with the medium of language. And so I actually do have a sense of what she would do in English um, that I don't have to just kind of create the author's consciousness out of thin air. Um, I, I actually had the author to, um, to consult. So that was very helpful to me. Um, it's certainly a resource that is valuable to have when you can. <laughs> I've translated some texts with, um, you know, by authors who are long dead and that's a very different experience. Yeah, um, I wonder, uh, I mean, it's cer certainly clear to me that this, there is this appearance in language on the semantic level, right? But Yanni, do you find yourself um, sort of uh, working with language that you think has slipped away from our 21st century German? Is there a particular rhythm or cadence you think that was there that could be traced in language, just the appearance that you talk about thematically, is it, is, it, is it there in language that is much harder to sort of pin down and sneak into the text? Now, yeah, uh, I think in my text, is, is, uh, it's, it's rather a question of the vocabulary. So um, as, as also Code said, there are special expressions uh, that make clear, is it an Easterner or a Westerner who's speaking, like Kaufhalle, which became supermarket, or which was actually, which was supermarket in, in Western Germany and, and in East Germany was Kaufhalle. So, so if you would meet someone asking you where the next supermarket is, you would immediately know it's someone from the West, not from the East, things like that. But, but in a way, I, I, I felt very connected to the literature of the 19th century. So I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm a good example for the, the colloquial a way of, of speaking, uh, which was used in, in East Germany. Although I, I, I consider it very interesting to, to uh, perhaps there, there have been made studies already, but uh, what I really liked about the uh, East Germans was that even the intellectuals would use uh, the, the, like the slang. Also after the, the, the wall um, fell, 
um, and they, when they were invited to some talk show, they would just speak like 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 work, working class people. And this was very this was very interesting. And in a way, I'm, I miss it a lot because also my father and me, when we would talk privately, we, we would use the the slang. And uh, the longer the the like the the, the Western society uh, continued uh, and or is still continuing, the the more I, I um, in a way I lost this kind of language. And, mm. and but it's not in my books so much because in the books I'm I'm hundred or hundred fifty years. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's it's not at all there. That's why I that's why I was wondering about. So uh, actually, in not a novel, you talk a lot about um, about literary influences, which I which I really love because you can you can really uh, feel the proximity to certain kind of um, you know sort of the, the the canon essentially. You talk about Walter Kempowski, you talk about o uh, Ovid, and I wonder who has Yeni Erpenbeck sustained attention and admiration in literature that is perhaps not in the book. Um, sag, sag, sag doch bitte nochmal auf Deutsch. <laughs> um, it's a very simple question. So, who are your literary influ influences? Yeah. Also, who, who else? Ich yes, who else? I mentioned the book. Naja, um, naja, who else? <laughs> you know, there, there's, uh, there's a long text about many, many people who, who influenced me. But um, I would say, perhaps in the first place, fairy tales. Mm of all kind and of all countries and of all times. So, so there, there were collections uh, available in the GDR of fairy tales of all the people all over the world. And I would really love to read these fairy tales. So, so I was full of these like uh, kind of, of stories. Um, I really love to read Idea Hoffmann, Storm, Keller, Stifter. My father, you know, he, he gave me Stifter in the age of 14 or so. <laughs> and I, 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 so I was 14. Uh, and I really liked it a lot. And um, Thomas Mann was important to me too. Uh, also his kind of humor. So, so he's normally he's considered very, to be a very serious author, but I think his, his humor is, 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 is very special about him. What, what do you think is special about Thomas Mann's humor? I'm like very curious. I, I did not, uh, admittedly, I did not think of him, him as, a, as an incredibly humorous author. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to be illuminated. Naya, for instance, the, the, the Madame Chauchat in the, in the oh, South yeah. Bank, where I, I think I wrote about it, but she, she's closing the door with a clash. And you would re immediately know she is entering the room when you hear the clash of the door and things like that. I can really laugh about it. So mm -hmm. I, I like it because it's, it's, uh, I can see that he had fun writing it. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. So just for one second, Kurt, I think we talked about this exact passage, right? When we, in preparation, mm -hmm. can you say like this, this, there was something in the translation that was difficult there, right? Yeah, and I, I can't remember the exact wording, but I think that I think that that was the one that I had translated as something like, um, I hear the way that she closes, that she slams the door. And that's one of those moments when the concreteness of the language, um, the concreteness of Jenny's phrasing really became clear to me when she said, no, you hear the slam, you hear the door, you don't hear the way because the way is an abstraction and what you hear is a sound, a thing that makes a sound. And, I think I had sort of transformed it into a very idiomatic English sentence. Um, I hear the way that he slams the door is certainly something that a person could say in everyday conversation and you wouldn't think twice about it. But it became clear to me that there was a precision to the way that she avoided an abstract phrase like that and chose a very concrete physical object-based description. Um, and so a few reference points like that stuck in my head as I was continuing to revise. So if I caught myself transforming concrete into abstract, I would try to bring it back to concrete because I had a feeling that that was where, um, that was where some of the power of Jenny's descriptions comes from, is the fact that they really 
do cling to objects and to the physical processes and not to a sort of um, nebulous abstraction that that is that is sort of um, extrapolated from those physical processes. Yeah, I'm I'm happy that that he's saying so because it's um, I in the, in the course also of our discussions I sometimes I I realize what I'm doing what mm -hmm. I'm not aware before discussing it you know then I have to explain something and I I uh, sometimes uh, I would like things to uh, to have a dialogue directly mm -hmm. but it's like like the things being alive. Mm -hmm. And it's not like, it's not an image of I use to make it sound like literature, but the things really are are talking to each other or things like that. And so so it's always, this is what you say, that's always con concrete and it's not, not an idea of, or an image used to express something. It's like, mm -hmm. like a direct conversation. Yeah. And, and yeah. I, I actually really like that because sort of when your prose is being talked about, then the disappearance um, and the temporality of it is always only placed into sort of the context of the GDR and sort of through the literary influences that you just mentioned, I think, and that Kurt's um, the discussion of the concreteness now I sort of see all of a sudden this connection to the to 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 writers like Stifter where there is sort of in the minute in this sort of like this very fine minute attention to to details I think that I, I, I now I see and of course also it's interesting mixing with the fairy tale genre now I now it's sort of like it became clear to me where all the kind of influences that wouldn't necessarily go well together all of a sudden sort of go well together <laughs> yeah it's, I, I think the, the 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 most important way to for a writer to to learn the the the, the craft of writing so to say is is to read and to to um to read good literature and to to get a feeling for how people are dealing with uh, descriptions and how they are doing it and i i i, I in the younger years I, I never wanted to become a writer so it just happened that that it entered my my thoughts and and my way of thinking yeah so the volume not a novel is such a compact little volume um um, new directions, really wonderful. But the German one is sort of a lot thicker, and it has a lot more texts and essays. And I, when I when I compared it to, I was wondering what and how you made the decision, what to include, what to leave out, and uh, what guided your decisions and that, or did you have to follow editorial processes and directives? Naya, I, I I was discussing it with uh, my my. Uh so to say, lifelong editor Declan Spring in, at New Directions. Uh, and um, he, he had the idea of uh, perhaps of putting the um, really uh, texts in it that are really connected to literature, especially. So he left out almost the whole music section because he thought that people yeah. might be interesting in my writing and perhaps not so much in, in me being a, an opera director, which was my first profession. So, so uh, one of the earliest, or perhaps the earliest text in the German edition is, is a text about uh, the, the loss of memory um, of uh, Siegfried in the Götterdämmerung. Mm -hmm. Once done uh, by, by Richard Wagner. So this is a very special um, text that I, I like very much, but you know, not everybody um, could be expected to be interested in, in the loss of memory of Siegfried in the Götterdämmerung. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so he, he left uh, text like like this one out and and some others who seem to be a, a bit similar to the ones we have in the book so I thought it, it makes perhaps it makes uh, uh, makes it easier to read yeah. because it's not such a big volume one has to carry with him <laughs> somewhere uh, it's um, the entrance is easier I think 
it's, it's uh, it makes people cu curious and and whoever wants to read more of it like has to has to take the German edition yeah when it, to read German Mm -hmm. How did you settle on the title, like Kein Roman? It's it's very it's very appealing, but also very odd because uh, usually it, it breaks with the rule that of, of of no negative definitions, right? It's it sort of comes it's like what it is not. Uh, how did you settle on it? And uh, yeah, I'm also interested in the translation, Kurt. Whether it was a it's a tra this straightforward thing, or you whether you had to think about it or not. Now, yeah. Um... There was one moment when it occurred to me that it was would be a good idea to call it not a novel because <laughs> everyone is expecting a novel, you know. Everyone is waiting for the new novel and is always asking when will the new novel be there and will be published. So so I thought it's very honest to say it's not a novel. <laughs> and then then I remember us having a nice uh, conversation. But tell you the story, Kurt. Yeah, I think um, Jenny's Jenny's suggestion was closer to the German, so no novel. Um, mm -hmm. Then the conversation that we had was um, sort of it should it should sound like something that you could say in conversation when someone says, "Oh, are you working on a new book?" and you say, "Oh, I am. It's not a novel." Um, and so <laughs> idiomatically, um, you wouldn't say it's no novel. So. My new book is not a novel. Um, it, it should be something that it, it, it's it's sort of a joke on some level that um, the book literally is not a novel. Um, so we we went back and forth a little bit about the title, but eventually settled on that because it had the kind of conversational feel to it that that you could you could just tell a friend or an editor you were working with that your new book is not a novel. Definitely, and it's also a real stumbling block. They were mm -hmm. definitely definitely have follow-up questions. It's a great conversation <laughs> starter. I prefer a follow-up question. So the, 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 um, the subtitle is very different than German and English. Even sort of the title is very similar, but the subtitle is very different. It says Texte und Reden in German, and in English it says a memoir in pieces. And um, I'm sort of wondering about, um, about a memoir in pieces. Is, is something very different than Texte und Reden? Naja, also Declan asked me to to um, to have a subtitle which uh, like is is more alive than just mm. speeches and text from this year to that year, which was uh, perhaps is a title that is made for German studies professors uh, in German. And uh, also the German version is more like a compendium of mm. all I did. It's it's it, in a way it's not. Uh, Perhaps it doesn't make it easier to to find its way to the to, to the readers. While the English translation, the, the English subtitle is more as that that makes clear that the book is full of of, of life experience and of of it, it, actually it is a memoir. And mm. perhaps we should have done so also with the German edition. I thought later because uh, people sometimes are, um, uh, naya they're hesitating to read uh, serious essays that are like, you know, you have to work through and, and it's no fun. It's like only science of literature or something like that, which isn't the case with this book because it's, it's full of my, my real life experience. I put some, some text in it, uh, which are very, very close to, to, to me, for, for, for instance, the one about the, the, the death of my mom, uh, which, which couldn't be, which couldn't have been more intense than if it was literature or called literature, so to say. And, and, and so I thought it was a good idea to give a subtitle to the book that makes clear that it is not like the dry side, the, the, the dusty science, but, but it's full of life. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I, so going from not a novel to an actual novel, um, which was uh, incredibly well received, both in Germany and, um, and in the English speaking world, uh, was uh, Gehen ging gegangen, Go went gone. Um, and um, um, 
so I just want to uh, um, talk about it because uh, what struck me as incredibly difficult about that uh, book was that you took up something that was um, happening right there in, uh, in uh, Berlin and Oranienplatz, um, 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 the refugees that uh, uh, and their housing situation, and you followed um, some of them, did much research on it, etc. And um, I wonder what prompted your decision to take this up in the form of a novel, because I mean there is this literary, literary critical cliche of the novel being a very slow genre. It takes a long time to write. It takes a long time to publish it. And did you see some sort of tension to the theme of it and sort of like that you chose because you also work as a playwright stage director, it would have been much or would it have been easier to actually sort of uh, put it on stage rather than write it in a novel? Um, no. <laughs> no. I, I, no, uh, the, the, the novel, um, uh, the novel gave me the, the opportunity to put uh, some, some, background to the whole uh, issue of, of uh, refugees uh, in terms of uh, like the, the so-called high education, you know, it's like uh, if you see uh, Odysseus, mm. you can see that he's a refugee mm. and, and there's a, you know, even the, the, the people who seem to be far away from all these problems, they they could be connected to it if they would just uh, remember that that also the ancient Greek stories, for instance, are are very very um, uh, intense in their life experience and in in like telling stories and 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 bringing people together or or like make in in, in making people. Um, open to for the suffering of others and and I, I wanted to to put it in this kind of um, uh, ja in, in einfach ich wollte den Umkreis einfach größer machen und uh, normally I, I would have taken more time to write a novel so so it, it, it wasn't easy to write it so quickly <laughs> um, and I, I would say I, I couldn't do so many times because it was just, <laughs> I, I was completely exhausted in, at the end of the book. But I, in a way, um, we, we so my, my publisher and I, we, we had the feeling that uh, this is the moment where the book should, should be published because it was clear to, to me that um, there's a problem arising even before the refugees arrived, the Syrian refugees arrived, there was already, um, there were already many, many of them in our cities to be seen. If you wanted to see them, if you wanted to look at, it, at them, uh, you, you could see that there is uh, a question involved. And um, yeah, I thought it's, it's high time to uh, to pay attention to this, to this uh, question. What did you find particularly challenging in turning to material with such actuality? Um, yeah, uh, also it, it, it was a challenge to, um, to learn so much myself, to hear so many stories and, um, and to, uh, in the end, I, I would have a list of all things that I still wanted to put into the book, and I just kept writing, 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 writing mm. like this because it was so. The, it, um, the problem turned out to be so so big and so complex. It, it, mm. it wasn't it wasn't only the 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 way of how they were welcomed or not welcomed uh, in Germany. It was also the bu bureaucracy and its Kafkaesque uh, mm -hmm. uh, side. Um, it was also the, the, the big question of um, how someone can survive 
the transition and not only the, the physical transition, but also the transition in terms of, of personality, of identity, of uh, like living on after having lost almost everything that formed you and gave you a, a basis in, in the world. Um, so there were, it, it was, um, on one hand, I wanted to, to write about the difficulties uh, of the real world. And on the other hand, I wanted also to, of course, write about the, the, the difficulties of, of, of uh, thoughts they're dealing with and, and losses they, they have had and hopes they, they have had. And yeah, so this was perhaps the... Yeah, to bring all this together was was the challenge. Yeah, what what is perhaps something that you had to leave out that you would have liked to include? Now, yeah, um, at the time when I finished the book, I managed to include everything which was <laughs> was on my my so called list. But afterwards, the story went on, and uh, one of the of the pieces in the um, not a novel is is like a, a like a next chapter to the book, uh, the the death of one of the refugees who who died by a heart, a heart disease. Um, I think like one year later, after the book was finished, and and in a way, I. I um, I would have, of course, included this, and but I but I couldn't, and so I I wrote a, a text for him, and and this text is also in the English uh, edition of the book. Yeah, um, and did you feel the novel as a form? or genre, or however you want to call it, crumble under all the material or, or bursting out of its seams? Naya, you know, I don't care what a novel is. <laughs> I'm so happy not to have stud studied German. <laughs> I, just, I just write what I feel like writing. So it's like, uh, you know, there are always people saying like, yeah, it's, so, it's such a like documentary book. It could have been, a, it shouldn't have been called fiction or something like that, but this, this is, mm. I think they are wrong and I don't care. It's like um, to put it in drawers is not my profession. And, um, mm. and I think it's, uh, it's a group of people, many characters in it all connected in one way or other. Um, it's like, it's also, if you, if you would call it a, a, a coming of age for a retired professor, a, a coming of age story. Um, so I would call it a novel. I definitely call it a novel. I just wondered if you, if you, I would definitely call it, but if it's, it's also these definitions don't matter that much. But like I, I was interested mm -hmm. in whether you, whether you had some struggle with, 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 with the form because, uh, because of the time, because of all the, all the, the complexity, the material that there's something unaccommodating, even not sort of mm -hmm. as we come, as we usually define it, something incredibly capacious about the genre, but something that makes makes it unhospitable or inhospitable, essentially, to certain kind of themes. That was, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, yeah, it was it it was perhaps more than with the other books I wrote, um, uh, like putting together step by step. So so mm. it was uh, it was waiting for things to happen and then include them in the book in the course of of life and at, at the same time in the course of writing the book. Yeah. Which, uh, but, but in a way, I, I, I was always afraid uh, what what kind of end mm. I could find for the book because I didn't know in the beginning there was no construction given in advance uh, or like invented by me uh, and in the very end I found out that the wife of my male ma um, uh, main character uh, was waiting to to uh, to give uh, to be given a voice and so so the end just all of a sudden appeared, but it wasn't constructed in the beginning. 
Yeah. So just, I, I find it fascinating that parallel that you're waiting for something to happen because it brings us sort of like back to, to one of the main themes that runs through most of your works, namely time and temporality and the possibilities a narrative to modulate, to warp, to, to represent time in different ways. And here it's interesting that sort of reality, quote unquote reality, caught up with, 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 with the writing. So you were kind of waiting for things to happen to include them in the, in the, in the, in the narrative. Uh, normally I, I would, uh, if I look from a, a bigger distance, I, I, I could deal with all the times yeah. And, and could shift it around <laughs> so to say this wasn't the case with this book yeah hmm. yeah um okay um so i see uh there are some questions in the chat uh so i would like to turn to those uh because uh we have very different questions um that are um i, I i'll not read them necessarily in the order in which we we received them but um so uh, Zach, Zach Kelly is asking, um, uh, Yanni, I work at the Slavic Eastern European Institute at UC Berkeley. Do you feel your pre-1989 life experience has an influence on your post-1989 life experience as a writer? Or do you feel a connection with East European writers such as Tokarczuk, uh, Ulitskaya, Hertha Müller? Um, yeah, of course. I, I um, the, the the years uh, until 1989 were the years that that uh, in, in which I grew up. So, and and as I said, um, the the there was also a certain uh, intellectual tradition uh, we always uh, referred to, uh, which was lost after 1989. So like the, the Mayakovsky or, or uh, other poets and, and, and artists, uh, the, in a way, um, you know, the, also the experience of uh, how quick such a change can be made and a whole system of ideas, you know, it's not, not uh, that I would say I, I, I was crying all the time, but it was like losing all the things that you knew, if they they might be good or bad, but you you uh, you have a like the the collapse becomes the the most important experience instead of something that stays. And I think the experience of collapse is very important. And of course, this has to do a lot with my uh, life before 89. Yeah. Um, Elisabeth Krimmer asks, Pauli, uh, Pauline Boss introduced the concept of ambiguous loss initially in an analysis of family dynamics a parent who is physically present but emotionally absent, but also in the context of a region. Um, that one hasn't left, but that has changed because of various environmental threats, such as flood or fire. I thought of this concept when I read your story about the street you grew up in, facing the Berlin Wall. In a way, it deals with a lost world, only much of this world is still there. Would you use a concept such as ambiguous loss to make sense of this and other experiences that you describe in your text? So what means ambiguous loss? Please translate. Um, um, it's a good question. It's like I'm trying to sort of capture in German what the English captures. Kurt, do you have something on the top of your head? Um, <laughs> um, the ambiguous in, doesn't seem like it. I wouldn't call it. Yeah, yeah, I, would, I, I see. Elisabeth Krimmer is explaining to me. Naja, oh, uh, Komplexität, would I say, mm. vielleicht? Naja, I, I Von think um, yeah. it, it, it's interesting that, that uh, uh, I think this question uh, is the question um, about the, the, the surface of something and all the things that are connected, like the, we, in NGDR, we used to call it basis und überbau, 
you know, things that are there in reality, and then the things that are associated with the physical um, entities. So, so in um, in Berlin, where I live, just around the corner, there is a famous, uh, like famous, there is a house, and they had the very good idea to write um, at the building in big letters uh, a sentence saying, uh, this house once stood in a different country, which I think is a, is a brilliant idea because it's, it's still the same house, but of course it's, it's different. And um, especially in Berlin, one can see that of course, many, many buildings are still there, um, but they are, have, been newly, have been newly painted so they, they look completely different and they have nothing to do with a, a way of life. I remember from the East German times, it was the, the way of life had to do with, um, it was more quiet, it was more private. <clears throat> uh, the, houses, <clears throat> the houses were uh, much more rotten, but uh, it was, um, in a way, it was also um, yeah, how would you call it? It was free inside. Also, I'm not sure if I can just explain this in English. <laughs> also, my gefühl is uh, that the the art des Lebens in diesen Häusern eine andere war. Und das eine ist, dass die Häuser jetzt äh, anders angestrichen sind und alles neu aussieht und alles in, in, in einer ähnlichen Zeit renoviert wurde, sodass alles ein bisschen wie in Disneyland aussieht, weil es alles gleichzeitig neu gemacht wurde. Aber es ist eben auch die, äh, wie soll ich sagen, diese Normalität, die verloren gegangen ist. Also diese, äh, in a way we were forgot, forgotten by the world. And this gave us a certain freedom because we, we were not in a competition. It was just like talking to each other and it was, it was more quiet. And I think when I uh, see the places that are still there, I always know which kind of, which way of life uh, isn't there anymore. Yeah. Um... I, we have very different um, questions in the chat and uh, one goes back to, um, to uh, go when gone and the questions that some of the questions that you take up in the novel. Um, Sydney Barger is wondering, I am interested in what you think about the treatment of Ukrainian refugees versus Syrian, African, Afghani, et cetera, refugees in Austria and Germany. Do you think they were being treated differently and why so? <laughs> Yeah, I think they are treated differently. Um, as we all know, there have been wars somewhere all the time, uh, but we wouldn't pay so much attention to it, for instance, in German or uh, Yemen or, or in um, also in African countries. And uh, it makes a difference uh, if the people come from far away or if they come from a country which is nearby. And so, uh, I th so my impression is that it's, it's always good if people are helping refugees, you know, whatever kind of, of refugees. And of course they need our help and they, they arrive at our borders directly because they are not so far away. And perhaps they also give us the impression um, that we might be the next refugees a bit later. So they, in a way, they they are closer. So the connection is not so difficult to to make. Uh, with the Africans, uh, even the Syrians uh, were um, welcomed much easier than the Africans. So, so my effort, African refugees, they waited for finding a place. They, they were waiting before the Syrians arrived and they would still be waiting after the Syrians were accepted. So, so for the Africans, it was much harder. 
um, perhaps also be because people might think that the culture is too, too different or that the Syrians and also the, the Ukraine, Ukrainian refugees, they are perhaps, you know, educated people that you can speak with in a, in the way you are used to speak to people. And the Africans, some of them at least, weren't that educated. So it was also a question of language. I don't know. So there are differences, yeah. I know that you are currently in New York. And uh, and I'm and you're also teaching at an American institution of higher education at NYU. And I'm wondering about uh, about how you see some of the things that uh, you frequently write about, uh, and your whole sort of over maybe from the position from being in the United States. Does it shine up in a different light? The themes that uh, that interests you most, and yeah, yeah. Um... I, uh, I took the chance to, to deal with uh, Eastern literature that I, I'm myself interested in. And uh, when I questioned myself when preparing the, 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 the seminar, uh, I, I would ask myself, why am I doing that? This, mm. Is this of any interest, you know? And, and just just because it's East German, this is not enough to, to you know, to make people interested in. I think, uh, in a way, it's a kind of archaeology that we are that we are going through now. Um, and what all of a sudden was very clear to me was that, um, especially the literature, takes uh, its freedom in in expressing uh, how how uh, how people deal with difficulties or hopes that that uh, haven't been realized or whatever and so the 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 language of literature at least of the good literature is always free and it's interesting to see how people uh, and perhaps the ex expression gets more intense when when there are difficulties mm. around, or you have to you have to play some tricks to to tell the truth, or however, and and you also you know there was a um, there was a deep thinking about borders, about uh, what language means when the two countries were divided and if there's a difference. And I think all these questions of um, also of hope that cannot uh, also, wie soll ich sagen? Also auch auch die 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 Hoffnung, die eigentlich in die gleiche Richtung ging wie die wie, wie die sage ich jetzt mal verordnete Hoffnung, die aber trotzdem eben eine andere Nuance, eine andere andere Intensität hatte und und auch eine vielleicht größere Ehrlichkeit in der, im, im Denken und auch in der Sprache. Ähm, diese Sachen, die verlieren ihre 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 Wichtigkeit nicht. Also es ist, äh, es ist nicht so, dass wir uns jetzt hier irgendwie für ein Land interessieren, was längst untergegangen ist, wo man sagt, okay, das war ein kurzes Kapitel in der deutschen Geschichte, sondern, sondern es ist eher so, ähm, da, sind, äh, da sind Schätze äh, zu finden, auch an, an Sprachkunst bei Wolfgang Hilbig, mhm. äh, der in der DDR praktisch... Ähm, gelebt hat und, und äh, also die meiste Zeit seines Lebens ver verbracht hat, äh, der ist vor allem ein Dichter. Und es wäre schade, wenn mit dem, äh, mit der, sage ich jetzt mal, auch äh, geringeren Wichtigkeit, die die DDR inzwischen hat, äh, diese Leute vergessen würden äh, oder nicht wahrgenommen würden, die, die wirklich große, große Autoren äh, waren. Ist das ein Blick, der durch die Distanz ermöglicht wird, also durch die geografische Distanz? 
Ähm, also das, bei, bei mir sehe ich das ein bisschen anders. Also ich, ich sehe bei mir nicht die Distanz, sondern eher die Nähe. Also ich habe mit meinem Vater oft darüber geredet, dass eine ganze Generation von Schriftstellern im Prinzip mit dem Mauerfall verschwunden ist. Also verschwunden heißt auch zum Beispiel äh, dann zum Fernsehen abgewandert ist, ins äh, Serien schreiben und so weiter. Aber als, als Autoren sind die verschwunden. Und es ist eigentlich eine, 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 eine kuriose Sache, wenn so eine ganze Generation von Schriftstellern plötzlich äh, einfach aufhört zu schreiben. Ne? Und, und solche Sachen sind ja, sind ja interessant auch als, wie soll ich sagen, als zweite Welle der politischen Veränderungen. Ähm, also finde ich eigentlich auch für, für Germanisten interessant. Ja, ich finde es auch, ja, auch interessant, welche Serien schrieben sie denn eigentlich? Ich fände es irgendwie relativ interessant zu wissen, dass DDR-Schriftsteller dann, dann kräftig an Traumschiff mitgearbeitet haben zum Beispiel oder Lindenstraße oder so. Das Schwarzwald, Schwarzwaldklinik. Und so. Schwarzwaldklinik. Manche haben, also manche haben einen Haufen Geld gemacht, weil die viele, also auch so, ich sage jetzt mal nicht, vielleicht die, die, die allererste Garde an, an Schriftstellern, aber doch, es gab ja viele, die einfach gute, handwerklich gute Autoren waren. Die haben natürlich zum Teil auch geschaut, dass sie einfach damit sich noch einen netten Lebensabend machen. Mhm. Aber es ist trotzdem komisch, also wenn man denkt, so, so, wo sind die Themen, wie, wie gehen Künstler eigentlich damit um, dass die Gesellschaft wegbricht? Ähm Und wie soll ich sagen, auch Künstler, die nicht oppositionell waren, waren Künstler. Das wird manchmal auch vergessen. Also es gibt auch Leute, die, ähm, die, über, die durch ihr Schreiben nicht in Widerspruch geraten sind, äh, die aber trotzdem jetzt keine, keine ähm, ja, wie soll ich sagen, keine Regierungsliteratur geschrieben haben. Hm. Es gibt noch ganz viele Fragen im Chat. Ich, lese, ich, ich, ich fasse jetzt zwei zusammen, die thematisch und die äh, vielleicht äh, auch zusammengehören. Um, Denise um, asks, uh, switching to English briefly, mm -hmm. is there a special affinity between the East German experience of loss, transition and transformation mm -hmm. while staying in place and the refugees experience of loss of home? Ja, yeah, I think there is, uh, there is a, um, a stronger connection than perhaps with the Westerners. Uh, although I, I, I could see that when the, 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 for instance, the Syrian refugees were welcomed also very intensely in West Germany, but uh, it was often the case uh, that people who themselves had uh, experienced the war and being a refugee as a child, they could also connect to the, to, the, to the new refugees because they had their own experiences, how it feels like losing home. Um, when, when I started to write uh, Go and Gone, I, I, uh, I haven't, in the beginning, I didn't make the decision um, that my main character would be an East German, but it turned out he, in a way he, He had to be one, <laughs> so because he mm -hmm. he remembers uh, how it feels like to to um, as a, to, to be like not not forced but forced by the circumstances to adjust to new rules to a different kind of society. Uh, money all of a sudden played a bigger role. Everybody was shocked because the rents were so high from one moment to the other. And, and all these fears one experiences, uh, I think they, they connected the East Germans per perhaps in a special way to the refugees. Yeah. We have a question by Margaret Schaefer. Um, and it actually sort of relates um, and it, um, it revolves around Kairos. Um, in Kairos, did you mean for the relationship between the 58-year-old man writer and the 19-year-old student to symbolize the relationship of the GDR to its citizens, i.e. how much of Kairos is a political allegory? Naja, in the book itself, I, um, I tell both uh, like storylines parallel. 
so so there is the love story and there is the decay of of the uh, GDR and also the de decay of the of the relationship um, so you can see it as as also a mm, an allegory to the to the political uh, history, but I would put it even in a in a bigger context, like um, how something that um, contains so much good and so much hope can turn into something that uh, is um, uh, is a like. A, turns into a bad force so to say and is forcing you to do things that that you didn't expect it, uh, to do and and so it's not only about gdr it's, it's more about the structure of power and of forcing people in many ways it is not just the main character forcing the the the, the girl in the book but um also, he loses power when he's uh, so-called set free, when he loses his job. So it's like all this together. Uh, how can we? How can we be in control of our, our lives? And when? When do decisions to have been made? We have a. Um, we have a perhaps a last question that really wonderfully relates to um, having power over one's own life or the lack thereof. We have a question by Tianya Wang uh, who asks you, did you feel empowered or renewed by language and creative writing after going through so many transitions? Um. No, I think um, renewed, I don't know, but I, I would say um, I, I consider it a great privilege to, to be allowed and even to be paid for, so to say, uh, to, 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 that, I, that I can take my time to think about all these uh, transitions um, and that I can choose my, the subject I write about freely and that I um yeah that this is my work to to uh, to choose my my subject and to think and to to become clearer but i i wouldn't say renewed it's like just um i can do what i like to do most and this is a privilege I think, I think that is a wonderful last word. Uh, uh, I, f uh, I can do what I like and that's a privilege. I think that's, uh, that uh, rings true for many of us. Uh, um, and um, we're really lucky um, to have been able to have this conversation today uh, with uh, Jenny Epmek and Kurt Beals. Our heartfelt gratitude uh, to for both of you to both of you for for being here with us today and sharing your uh, your creative um, 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 processes with us today. And um, um, please, if you would like to access the um, the recording of this event, you'll find it on the on the Berkeley uh, German Department's website, Archives of Migration. And uh, thank you all for coming and uh, a wonderful rest of your day. Uh, um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much.